is salvation. There's no other name. He is our faith. He's our shield of faith. He is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. He is the gospel. He is salvation. There's no other name. He is the shield of faith. We cannot be defeated. We cannot be overcome. I think all of us deal with something. I don't know of anybody that doesn't. I, you know, and it's pretty cool that we're this honest. Anybody ever heard anyone lie to you? I mean, we're capable. Yeah. Anyone ever lied to y'all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People are capable of lying. Yes? I just lied now. Donnie's so brazen, he lies in church. Have mercy, Lord. I have never talked to a single person that says everything in my life is perfect. I'm perfect in every way. I don't care if they're Christian, not Christian. I've never had anyone say, I'm perfect. We all realize we have flaws. And here's what you're going to find out. People that really are growing nearer and nearer to the Lord. I, I, have, I have watched this for over two decades now, pushing three decades. I have watched those that are nearest to the Lord, those that really are in pursuit of God, that spend large amounts of time in prayer, that they are passionate about Jesus. They have no desire to miss Him. They want His will in everything. They see their flaws more clearly than anyone else. It's like the nearer we get to Jesus the more we realize just how much we need Him. Grandma Pace was 104 years old. And I asked her, I said, Grandma, has the devil ever stopped messing with you? you? And she said, Brother Barry, this has been the most terrible week I've ever had. I thought, well, that's something to look forward to. The longer you're alive, the worse it gets. But in Deuteronomy, chapter 33, I just dealt with issues my whole life. And I don't like them. And the closer I get to God, the less I like them. I don't want to be like I am about some things. Anybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And I've dealt with this. I've prayed about it. I can't tell you how many times I've been to the altar over it. I've spoke to it. Confessed the right thing. Stood on the word of God. But sometimes it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's worry. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's bad habits. Maybe it's anger. Jealousy. Unforgiveness. Just something that people struggle with seems like everybody else just handles it so well that there's just something that each of us struggle with. Yeah. And it's like Sunday night, Monday morning, early, early. And that's when God speaks to me so many times. I'm just starting to wake up. And I, I, my mind is not kicked in yet. Because how many of you understand when your mind kicks in, it starts to... And just gets so loud you can't hear anything. All the things you've got to deal with. All the things you've got to take care of. Everything going on. All the jobs you need to get done that day. And it's in my heart. And, and I just, I tell him, I say, God, I don't even... And I'm not even just fully addressing it because I believe the Bible and the Bible tells us that He knows what we have need of even before we pray. Yeah. 
And so I'm not even mentioning what it is. I'm just talking to him because I already know what. I know he knows what's on my heart. And I said, Lord, I need a word from you. Speaking of what is wrong with me. And I just shut up. And I don't know how long I sat there. But I, I cannot encourage you enough to do this. To practice this in your prayer time. And I'm going to be honest with you. There's lots of times I do that. I hear nothing. So don't beat yourself up. If you have tried to hear God's voice. And you don't hear anything. That's okay. It happens to everyone. But sometimes. He speaks. And maybe he's speaking all the time and I'm just too dumb to hear. I don't know. I'm interested to talk to him about that someday. But the Bible says as soon as I see him, I'm going to be like him. And I'm going to know as I'm known. And so then I'll know. So I won't need to ask. <laughs> but until I get there, I'm still in this dilemma. And I sat there. I laid there. Actually, I'm in bed. And I'm just laying there and I'm just shutting. I won't, won't think. I'm just listening. And there's an old song. I've been singing it for literally months. Leaning on the everlasting arms. I mean literally for months. I wake up. I'm singing that song. And if, if you don't know the song. It's an incredible song. And, and the inspiration for the song came as a, a teacher uh, a Bible teacher had two of his students contacted him back in the 1800s and said, our wives have just died. And it's interesting, the two husbands, the husband of two wives, just at the same time passed. You know, it's weird enough that somebody's wife dies, but for two wives to die, that's pretty incredible. And this man is trying to figure out, what do I say to console these men? How can I encourage them? And he's, God gave him this verse. And see, I didn't know any of that. But I knew when I heard it for the 77th time in 78 days, I knew God was trying to talk. You know, see, that's what I'm talking about. How dumb am I? I've been hearing this song for over two months, and I can't figure out God's talking to me. I'm just thinking that's a good song. I got the right song in my head. I'm not thinking about Aggie Breaky Heart. I'm not thinking about Luke and Bach, Texas. I ain't thinking about none of this other garbage that's going on. And I really, those aren't my gigs. I mean, I, when I was like ACDC, I mean, I got to get the bad stuff out. Boom. Oh, Jesus, have mercy. Deliver me. Satan, come out. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about, but some of you do. And so I start, I know God's talking to me about that song. And so I go and I start digging up the history of the song. And I find out who wrote it, who wrote the music, who wrote the lyrics. And here's the inspiration for the song. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27. This is for us. I'm sharing this. This is my word. But I'll let you use it. <laughs> if you don't mistreat it. The eternal God. This is God's word translation. This is my favorite. For this verse. I think they nailed it. The eternal God is your shelter. There's several, several words, that, several translations, refuge, fortress. And his everlasting arms support you. He will force your enemies out of your way and tell you to destroy them. I'm telling you, God has breathed on this text for us right now. We do. All of us are facing a, a universal enemy. Every one of us. Uh, this virus is part of his bag of tricks, his weapons, his devices. However you want to look at that. 
But, but it's bigger than a virus. I think the worry and the fear that accompanies the virus is worse than the virus. Yeah. And I know people are like, but you don't know that it's the right thing. And there's people that aren't here because they don't know that it's the right thing to come back to God's house. And I agree with that. I don't know that it's the right thing. I don't. But here's how I look at it. If I get sick and die because I came to worship God, that's probably the best reason that I can get sick and die. See, there's a crowd of people here, not a great crowd, some will be watching later. There's a good chance in a group of people this side, some of y'all looked at pornography this week. Good chance. There's a real chance some of you had sex outside of marriage. There's a chance that some of you look at another, whether it's, and you know, you've got to qualify all this stuff nowadays because men are looking at men with lust. Used to be just men would look at women with lust. Now, you know, men are looking at men and men are looking at children. And, and they're justifying it. Do you understand that? There, there are psychological studies being done right now that, that's going to make pedophilia a choice, uh, or not a choice, a, a way that you're born just like homosexuality. You, you can look at me and think that's not true, but I promise you there's already been several studies done and they're working diligently because the pedophiles are saying if homosexuality is not a choice, neither is pedophilia. It's a simple sexual orientation. Because when you start taking what God says in the Bible and twisting it around, there's no end to it. How are you going to tell them that they can't have a dog or a horse or a cow or a monkey or whatever? You can't. Once you open that door, have you ever heard of Pandora's box? Once you open the box, you can't shut the lid. The only one that has control to shut it now is God. So we better stand on this. The eternal God is our refuge. The eternal God is our security. The eternal God is the one that we run to. We are not going to cow to fear. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not bashing you. I'm not. If, you, if you're listening to this, you're, I'm not. Come, okay, I'm good. It doesn't bother me in the least. Just don't be afraid. Yes. Yes. I mean, do you want to be? Do you want to fall over dead looking at porn, or do you want to fall over dead worshiping Jesus? I think, I think being in God's house is not that bad a thing. There's worse places to get sick. Jesus have mercy. There's cities in this world. I mean, if you go there, you probably going to get some. But you know what? People keep going there. You know they do. Man. Blue Bell Ice Cream was killing us left and right. Yeah. And we couldn't wait for it to get back on the store shelves. <laughs> but we're, we're afraid now. I'm like, I, I, yeah, baby, you want a bowl of ice cream? She don't get sick, I'll eat some. <laughs> well, my, well, Mike says Bronx has good ice <laughs> But the eternal God is our, he's our safe place. He's our refuge. He's the one that we can run to. And, and we got to be doing this right now. This is, there's never been a better time to run to Jesus. Somebody say, well, I don't want to run to him when I'm afraid. What better time is there to run to him? And this is my, I love this. So he's, he's someone that we can run into. He's over us. He's the roof over our head. He's the walls around us. He's the floor under our feet. The immovable rock of Christ upon which He has built His church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. 
But here's probably my favorite part. And since God gave me this word, he's been helping me. Do you want help? I'm talking about things that you haven't been able to get past. Things that you haven't been able to get over. Something that's just ruling your life. You don't want it in your life. You want it out of your life. And you've tried to get it out of your life. You've done everything that you know to do. They anointed you with oil so many times that you've been selling it by the barrel. They've laid hands on you so many times. You've got a, you've got a callus on your forehead. Your knees are callous because you prayed about this so much. But you just can't get free. Here's a word for you. And His everlasting arms support you. See, not only are we standing in Him and on Him and He's all around us and over our head, but He's the one that's holding us up. I mean, just like a little baby learning how to walk. And Father is not going to let us go. He's got a hold of us. He's going to help us learn how to walk this thing out. And this is the key. Quit trying to do it on your own. Lean on Him. Rely on Him. Trust Him. He is able to do this. He'll hold you up. How many of you remember when Charles Johnson and the Revivers came to Barnstall? Wow. Charles Johnson is the, he is the man. He said so many things that were so incredible. And, and I know Sawyer remembers because he said we keep going in bursts in ourselves. <laughs> Making fools out of ourselves here in public. Public. Yeah, my mom, dear Lord, mother, if you're watching this, we still remember. <laughs> And he sang a song. I can't even walk yeah. without him holding my hand. Right. Well, stop trying. Yeah, Just hang on to him. Right. He's solid. He's safe. He's secure. He's faithful. And he's not going anywhere. Right. He made us his promise. He told us, he said, be content with your wages. I'm like, I don't understand that exactly. Why he said that before he said this. This is why we can be content with our wages. Because I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. Thank you, Lord. He will never leave us. Maybe he knows how worried we get about money. In most divorces. Or for two reasons. The money is one of them. Yeah. He will never leave us. Yeah. Is God in your life? Then he's not going anywhere. I don't know where you're headed. But God is He's seated. And we can either be seated with him. Or we can run off into the pig pen. But I encourage you to stay next to Jesus. Right. Because he ain't going nowhere. No. I'm almost to quit in case you're worried. <laughs> he will force your enemies out of your way. I, I said this the other night. It's like the big brother. He's behind us. The bully that just won't leave us alone. Our big brother is marching us to him. And I had a good friend. He's went on to be with the Lord. But he's, he was such a help to me early in my walk. And I worked with him down at the plant. And every day, another man that's went on to be with the Lord. And see, there's relatives of both men sitting in here right now. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. And every day, if they lived out here on Wrangell Heights... If he didn't beat him to the bridge, it used to be a bridge he could walk across up Bird Creek, further up the creek than this one. If he didn't beat him to the bridge and get across, he got whooped every day. Every day. See, we didn't used to shoot each other, we just fought. Unless you were like me, 
And I got whipped, so I quit. And finally, this man's older brother grabbed him up by the nap of the neck. And he drug him down there to that ditch where the fighting took place. And he threw him out, threw him down in that ditch. And he said, you ain't coming out of there till you whoop him. So he knew it was bad. I mean, he could either take a whooping from somebody his own size or his big brother's going to stomp a mud hole right through him. So he thought, I ain't coming out of there until I whoop him. So he commenced to whoop him. And he said, whenever I got out of that ditch, he said, from that day forward, he said, if that other brother didn't beat me to the bridge, he got whooped. The big brother turned it around. See, the kid was afraid. He didn't know that he could whoop the guy that was bullying him. He didn't let this guy bully him for a year, maybe two years. And he just kept letting him, kept letting him, kept letting him because he didn't think he could stand up to him. But the big brother made it happen. And you know the kid ain't going to say nothing to the big brother. Right? We got Jesus. He is right behind us. He's marching us right to this enemy. Right to this fear. Right to this anxiety. Right to this addiction. Right to this perversion. Whatever it is, He's marching us up right to it. And this thing is looking at Jesus. It's not looking at you. This thing is not afraid of you. It's ruled you your entire life. But it is terrified of the one that is behind you. And Jesus said, now get in that ditch and don't you come out till it's whooped. Because I'm standing right here. I'm not going anywhere. We're beating this thing from now on. I have exposed it. I've driven it out. It's come out of the shadows. It's out of the darkness. It's out of the shade. It's right here in front of you. Now that's what he said. And tell you to destroy them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's time to destroy them. Yeah. It's time. Mm -hmm. You can. Yeah. Say, well, I've never been able to up to this point. Then you get Deuteronomy 33, 27. You get that into your spirit in such a way that this is my word. This is wor my word from God to me. God has breathed on this passage of Scripture for right now. This is a rhema word for right now. Whatever that enemy is, whatever that thing is, right now, God's given me a word. He's going to expose the enemy. And he's going to give me the strength to whoop it. Hallelujah. And from now on, if that sucker doesn't beat us to the bridge, we're going to whoop it every day. Hallelujah. I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm going to shut up. Y'all stand up. Or sit down. You can lay down. I don't care. I bet people go to sleep. Lay down in the pews. It don't bother me. Whatever you're comfortable with. I had a guy come up to me one time. He said it takes a clean conscience to be able to sleep in church. <laughs> he also told me some other things that I don't want to repeat. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I don't want everybody freaked out because we're laying hands on everybody. I don't want to freak anybody out. But if you'll receive that this morning, yeah, yeah. I just want you to receive that. And I'm telling you, Jesus loves you. He loves you so much that he died for you. The entire weight of my sin is upon Jesus. Everything I've ever done wrong, 
Jesus paid for. And now I don't have to carry it because Jesus bore it. That's the gospel. You can receive that by faith today. It can be yours today. It can be yours. You say, well, Brother Barry, I struggle with doubt. I don't know anybody that hasn't doubted at some point or another. But if you really, if you really need some evidence... Open your Bible when you get home to Psalm 22. And you will see David, the psalmist, records perfectly the crucifixion. And you've got to understand that David wrote that about 500 years before crucifixion was a way of execution in the world. The Romans were the ones that started crucifixion because they were so cruel. They were looking for the cruelest way to kill a person. And crucifixion, most agree, is one of the most heinous deaths you can die. Literally, sometimes people would hang on a cross for two weeks before they died. Jesus was so near death that he only hung for a few hours. People said, why did he die so fast? Because they almost killed him before he got there. Five hundred years before the Romans invented crucifixion, David... He portrays it perfectly in Psalm 22. Read it. If you can still doubt, if you're a reasonable thinking person and say this was written a thousand years before Jesus died, 500 years before the crucifixion, and you can still say, I don't believe it. You have a lot more faith to not believe God than I have to believe God. You're exercising way more faith to stay in unbelief. Because if you can read that and still doubt, I don't even know what to say. It will encourage your faith, even if you're a Christian and you're struggling in your faith. Read Psalm 22. You'll go, wow. That's amazing. How did he know that? Because Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. God knew what was going to happen before he ever created the earth. And he did that for you. And he did that for me. He loves us.